Okay, so today our webinar uh, is on foundations for establishing a common agenda. Uh, some of you may have joined us at our member gathering in October, and some of you may or may not have been able to participate in this workshop uh, where we heard from both Saskatoon and Peel region. Now, uh, today is a great opportunity to learn more about the foundations for establishing a common agenda. Uh, some of this may be familiar. Uh, this is an opportunity, hopefully, some of you have been able to reflect uh, on some of some of uh, these preconditions for getting to your community plan and you're coming with perhaps some more uh, questions um, or uh, insights. So today we have Colleen christopherson Cote joining us to share Saskatoon's experience of getting to a common agenda. Uh, key principles to consider when laying the foundations and those that set communities up for success ahead of implementing a community plan. Colleen specializes in building intersectoral collaboratives to address a complex, complex issues like poverty, housing, and community safety and well-being. As a coordinator for Saskatoon Poverty Reduction Partnership and as a coordinator for the Safe Community Action Alliance in Saskatoon, Colleen weaves webs of relationships that not only break through the confines of system silos, but also disrupt the hierarchies within them that so often prevent timely holistic action on critical issues. Colleen's colleagues celebrate her ability to find clarity in chaos, to pull diverse perspectives into a unified vision and carve collective paths forward, even when it's not the path of least resistance. So I am going to hand it over to Colleen to get stuck into it. Okay. Over to you, Colleen. Put the slides too, please. <clears throat> so um, I wanted to do a little bit of context, but uh, also sort of reinforce that this is a similar presentation to what we did in um, Kitchener. Uh, a comparison between sort of what's been going on in Saskatoon and what's been going on in, in Peel, but I'm just going to focus obviously on the work in Saskatoon. Um, but before I get started, I, it's sort of interesting for me to see the photo in the slide of Saskatoon today. <clears throat> it's minus 20-ish for the wind chill and snowing, so I will hold on to the lovely landscape that is in the, the picture of our river um, and and make a comment about uh, Saskatoon and where it's located in case there are folks here who don't really know where we are. Um, so located centrally in the province along the um, South Saskatchewan River, it's an extremely important piece of geography in our community. Um, we are located in Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis. It's extremely important to us to recognize the work that came ahead of us um, and that our ancestors and relationships with people, um, particularly First Nations and Métis folks who uh, paved the way and built um, so many of the mechanisms and options for us to be doing this work. Uh, and so um, I did do a little snapshot of some of the data. Uh, we're working, I'm working in poverty reduction. So here's, there are some like infographic snapshots of uh, some of the relationships and data pieces in Saskatoon. Um, quite often we focus these pieces on deficit language um, and so we're also in the process of trying to figure out how we might be able to spin some of these pieces into more asset-based language but basically um, Saskatoon has uh, a lot of folks living in poverty we have deep racial divides um, we have over representation of indigenous folks living in poverty uh, and we have rich and uh, trauma-filled histories um, throughout uh, sort of what built our culture in, in Saskatoon. And so I think it's important to just stop and reflect on the fact that all of these um, years and years of histories, uh, truths and um, traumas, have built sort of the current landscape that we are living in. Uh, so you can flip the next slide. So Saskatoon Poverty Reduction Partnership has been in existence for about 10-ish years. It was born out of a community dialogue uh, where about 150 or so people came together and said, we need to pull together a collaborative table uh, that looks at poverty in Saskatoon. Um, up until uh, the launch of the 12 Bold Ideas to Eliminate Poverty. 
in Saskatoon. Um, we were focused more on provincial and, and the call for a provincial strategy. Uh, Sa Saskatchewan in general was the last. Some would maybe argue if there are any BC folks on the line that maybe BC was the last. We can go back and forth. Um, but we didn't have a provincial strategy to end poverty. Uh, and so some of the work of SPRP was focused on calls for the provincial strategy. That happened. Uh, and when that happened and things sort of came about from that strategy, we decided um, that the SPRP would focus more on a local context. Uh, in the same time period that this local context changed, uh, we had a change in, in governments uh, federally and municipally, not provincially. And so the change to the Liberal government and an appreciation for a federal strategy uh, and the creation around federal strategies for limiting poverty in Canada, coupled with um, an interest in social community development from our municipal governments, um, sort of speared on the conversation around a local poverty reduction strategy. So uh, SPRP convened teams to build um, over the course of about 18 months, uh, the 12 bold ideas to eliminate poverty in Saskatoon. And that document has been publicly released and now we're in implementation phase. And so I'll run through in the next couple of slides um, the mechanisms that we came to uh, to use and to build this collaborative uh, document, and then the next steps around how we might be able, able to implement it. Um, I think Al said you can ask questions in the chat box. You can also just butt in and ask me questions. I think that's all right as well. I'm going to try not to talk for more than about 30 minutes, and then there'll be lots of time uh, for people to ask questions. Um, so you can do the next slide. So this is a little bit of the governance structure because we're talking about collective action uh, and um, creating a common agenda, which is the first condition for collective impact. Um, I thought we should just back up and talk a little bit about how the SPRP is governed because it's a little bit unusual. So we took the, the what we thought were the best pieces of collective impact uh, and also some pieces from the constellation model and we kind of mushed them together and created a structure that uh, is working for us. And so the, the backbone uh, is a community entity, Saskatoon Food Bank and Learning Center. Uh, the interesting thing about having a community entity, nonprofit, charitable organization as our backbone is that it's considerably more nimble uh, than using a government agency that has a lot more um, structural pieces in it and hierarchical pieces in it and potentially power pieces in it. Um, so the so the Saskatoon Food Bank and Learning Centre holds all of the funds for the SPRP. Uh, it's also important to note that the SPRP doesn't have federal or provincial funding. It is locally sourced funds. Um, I work half time as the coordinator, so I'm in the centre of that little diagram around the internal structure, holding the pieces together. There are two big teams, a leadership team, which is the visioning team. They meet quarterly. Um, there's about 95 partners. They don't all come to meetings, but there are about 95 partners on the mailing list. Uh, and then there are um, the management team, which are the funders predominantly, and they come and meet monthly uh, and make sure that I meet the deliverables. And then there are a series of action teams, and those action teams bubble up based on energy uh, and based on the common agenda based on the evidence that comes from our measurements, um, and based on ideas that partners might have that are tied back to the vision of the leadership team. Um, interesting, the little red dots that are in the diagram are funds. And so while the management team holds the funds for the coordination, um, action teams are encouraged to self-fund projects. And so the management team and the leadership team have no um, say or no impact on the way that that fund those funds flow into action teams they're encouraged to seek out those funds uh, and self-fund but they can also come back to leadership uh, and ask for funding if they need uh, and in behind all of this work are community connections and emerging actions and then in behind that is the entire community as a whole uh, and so we're constantly trying to figure out how all these pieces are connected to other people's work and other community consultation other community collaborations. Um, I, I'm uniquely situated because I work, uh, contract work on, a mul on multiple different projects that are collaborative. And so 
Uh, in the intro, SPRP was mentioned, but also SCAA, the Safe Community Action Alliance, which is also a big collaborative that has a team of coordination. Uh, and they're all sort of interconnected. And so the thing that is interesting around creating the common agenda is around whose agenda um, are we working on? How are they mutually connected? What are the unique pieces that we do on our own? And what are the pieces that we come together and do as a, as a more collaborative or collective impact approach? Um, and so we have modified this constellation model slash collective impact model over probably the last five or six years and are now at a position where I think we're fairly stable. Um, funding though, clearly, I mean, we all have funding issues and so funding comes and goes. Uh, the interesting piece about having multiple small funders to fund the management of it is that when one funder falls off the table, um, it's not catastrophic to the entire process. And so we try to diversify small funding, small funding pools. Um, we also made a conscious decision to not actively participate in community grant writing uh, in competition with core partners who make up the management leadership and action teams. Uh, and so if we end up grant writing for any particular program or policy, then um, those pieces are done um, under the guidance of the entire team. Okay, I think that's it. Next slide. So, um, you, for those of you who have been around Tamarack forever, you'll hear this statement, I stole it probably from Liz and or Paul at any given time, that authentic community change moves at the speed of trust. Um, and so getting that buy-in and building partnerships are the critical piece to building a really effective common agenda. Um, I think in Kitchener, Paul used the metaphor about meeting on a front porch. Um, out here, I spend more time in mud than I do in the front porch. Um, and the muddiness and the chaos of it all um, is what drives the work. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of pieces that could be negative around this, but I feel like when we talk about scarcity and uh, founder syndromes or primary funders or power, um, the rigidity and unwillingness to change, um, and all of those sort of constants, uh, things that cause uh, situations to maybe get derailed, um, those are all rooted in relationship and networking and trust. And so if you're going to build a common agenda and work towards collective impact and, and common goals, then that trust and relationship piece are the currency. And so how do you build um, a really solid trusting relationship uh, and move the work forward, keeping in mind that you know that all these challenges and potential pitfalls exist. Uh, and so we spend all of our time trying to uh, work around and work through the mud. Okay, next question or next slide. Uh, so we organize our work into what well, was three and we've added a fourth. So um, traditionally or historically we did catalyzing, convening and coordinating action and partners and energy. Uh, and we've recently added more deliberately added the word collaboration into the work. Uh, and created the definition around the way that what it means to us. And so um, collaboration refers to the engagement of people uh, in order to create an environment conducive for solving complex issues with plausible solutions uh, for which they take responsibility uh, and catalyze the contributions and assets of stakeholders into action. And so this is really about the partnership uh, and the SPRP as a whole working as a collective but that the individual agencies within it who commit to the work take on responsibility to do the work as well. Uh, and that the solutions that we're creating are actually, we're actually capable of implementing them. And so we'll talk in a little bit about evidence and, and uh, evaluation frameworks, but I feel like when you build a really great common agenda and move this work forward, that if the evidence isn't there and if the solutions aren't plausible, uh, then you start to erode trust and, and the legitimacy of the work. Okay, next. So how do we do this? There's a schwack of tools out there. Tamarack has a, uh, uh, a lot of tools and many of the tools that they've developed, um, we've used. Uh, I just wanted to showcase a few of them that we work with. Um, so shared visions and sets of guiding principles. Every single action team um, if you think back to that big circular diagram, uh, and I should think today we have uh, probably 12 action teams that are functional and another five that are emerging. 
Um, each of those action teams will have its own set of guiding principles. They're quite similar, but they go through them in the beginning parts of the work to make sure that everyone around the table understands why we're there and what we're doing um, and what that shared vision, how that shared vision is collect, connected back to the big vision of the 12 bold ideas to eliminate poverty and how they're all interconnected. And so then we talk a lot about why um, I stole and modified um, Simon Sinek's Golden Circle. So if you haven't seen any of his work, you can Google search him. Um, but it talks about the difference between why, how, and what. Um, and I think when we build logic models and theories of change and systems maps and talk about um, building a shared vision, we're really good at talking about hows and whats, but we lose track of why sometimes. And so most of the work that we're working on uh, within the SPRP uh, is rooted in why. And so we have a fundamental understanding across all of the partners who are at the table around that, that piece of why. Um, and then there's other things like, well, logic models and theories of change, you can see Tamarack has lots of examples. Um, I spend a lot of time because I like system mapping and process diagrams. Um, I do a lot of system mapping uh, and have used uh, modifications of things like lean training around value stream mapping, which is meant to sort of look at maybe patient flow in hospitals, but what does that look like from a systems perspective and how do people move through systems and where are all the barriers and gaps? And then using those barriers and gaps to create common agendas and, and sets of um, opportunities and, and areas for work. Uh, SWOT analysis and brainstormings. We also do um, something called the solutions value graph decision-making process. So talk about you know, how much energy does it cost to put into it and what's the outcome? Um, things that take a ton of energy and don't have big outputs, do we spend time doing them? What are they? Um, things that don't take a lot of time and have lots of outputs, are those the things that we should be focusing on? Not one area is more important than others, we just need to make sure that we know um, where the energy lays and how much capacity we have before we take on projects and, and make commitments to doing um, individual pieces of the agenda. Um, I think it's Liz, maybe it's Mark Kabaj that talks about usual and unusual suspects. I feel like um, mapping your partner connections and building this web of who is all connected and where are the big holes um, is a critical piece. I recently just did this um, with a project partner who was looking at building, one of their outcomes was to build um, external capacity and build partnerships with external partners. And so we mapped all of their partner connections and realized that um, they don't need to build external partnership connections. It's actually internal that they don't have any connectivity to. And so it's really interesting when you start drawing things out, um, the way it redirects work uh, and solidifies and or illuminates places where you might want to spend more time or less time. Uh, and then interestingly in, in Kitchener, I said that we do consensus building and we also have decision making policies built into our guiding principles. Uh, and that we have an opening statement that is sort of required or encouraged um, to be read at every single SPRP related meeting. Um, we do it at all the big meetings, we do it at anything that we co-host, um, community events, all of those things. And it's really meant to talk specifically about inclusive um, uh, and safe space, but also the idea that there's power in all of this work and that we need to disrupt those power imbalances. And so, I added this slide, you can flip to the next slide, um, to this slide deck because people had asked, it was like, I, I often get requests for information after a conference, but I had a ton of requests for the opening statement. And so here it is. Um, and so what we do is read it, um, just sort of set the tone. It's almost like a moment of silence or a way to sort of bring everybody down to, or bring everybody together. Um, so I'll just read it to you because I think it's, it's interesting when you hear it out loud. Um, so we acknowledge that we are meeting today on Treaty 6 territory in the traditional homeland of the Métis. Let us acknowledge today that some of us are present, are professionals, some are volunteers, and some are enthusiastic and passionate community leaders. There may be some of us who have traveled great distance and some who live here, oh, there's a typo, and call Saskatoon Treaty 6 territory home. To those who are visiting, welcome. We understand that we are we all have a unique story. Some of us here may be living in poverty or have experienced challenges making ends meet, while others here are not living in poverty and have safe and secure housing. 
We acknowledge that we don't know everything there is to know about one another, but as we walk, as we work through the day and respect and embrace, we respect and embrace our diversity. We are enthusiastic to share our stories. Within this group, I see tremendous opportunity, strength, and wisdom. We also need to recognize that many of us have more practice at being at meetings and public speaking, but we all experience uncertainty at times. We acknowledge that everyone here has something important to say, something important to contribute to our purpose. We are here because we all want to work together to make our communities safe, strong, and more vibrant. And so I feel like every time I read this statement at the beginning, it just sort of levels this understanding and appreciation for why we've come together, but it also recognizes that not every single person in the room is at the same level. And so quite often, um, I, quite often you'll see some of the folks who hold a fair amount of power in the room feel a little bit uncomfortable. And I think disrupting power imbalance is about making people feel uncomfortable, but it's also making, it's, it's also about making them feel safe. And so creating that safe space is one of the things that we're committed to doing. Okay, you can flip the slide. Uh, so then the other piece around this is around evaluation. When we set out to do uh, 12 Bold Ideas to Eliminate Poverty in Saskatoon. We talked to some of the folks across Canada who have a fair amount of experience uh, building local poverty reduction strategies. Toronto, Edmonton, Vancouver, Hamilton, um, there's a bunch of them, right? And so the one thing that we learned from talking to a ton of different people was that I, I asked them if you could do, what, could you, what would you do differently if you were starting over, like we we're just starting? And all of them said, build an evaluation framework before you launch the work. And I was like, oh, that's a pretty tall task because we don't actually even know what we're evaluating. And so luckily we have at the SPRP a really amazing cohort of, uh, I call them evaluation geeks. So folks who love community-based evaluation and who are rooted in this work. And so I convened a team of evaluators and, and posed the question <clears throat> around, <clears throat> See, that's why I have lots of water. I pose the question around how we might evaluate something that we don't have yet. And then how do we build the 12 bold ideas knowing what the evaluation framework could or should look like? And so um, a couple of uh, professors from the university took hold of this. And in, the, and in the same sort of time period that all of these conversations were happening, the federal government committed to market basket measure. And so um, we use all three of the indicators, but we do, do, we do use market basket measure here to talk specifically about living wage uh, and to talk about um, the cost of poverty in, in this province. <clears throat> so we took the market basket measure as our, as our centerpiece and said, you know, what are the pieces of, of baskets? And then, so that's the centerpiece. And then the big, the next circle out with the black writing um, that says alternative school models and childcare and transportation and community-based food assets are the 12 bold ideas. And then the ring around that is the provincial government's um, poverty reduction strategy. So we took their language and embedded it in and decided like where would their, if we were going to achieve their outcomes, how are we achieving it with what parts of the 12 bold ideas and which parts of the market basket measure are most connected? And then the, yeah, the red language is the federal strategy. So if we were going to achieve the federal government goals with our local strategy, where would that fit? And so then we just tied all the, the language together and pulled indicators out um, and are tracking now indicators tied to all of these things. And the thing that it's created is an opportunity for us to talk specifically about um, how we're addressing federal and provincial and local um, outcomes. And then we've also coupled all of our indicators to um, three big, yeah, we'll share everything. You can have the slide deck, it's all cool. Um, we've coupled our indicators to three big impact assessment criteria. There's an another, there's another entire um, conversation going on in Saskatoon specifically to these three criteria. So changes to capacity, internal partners and individual change, changes to behavior, external and external partners and community change, and changes to society, external partners and non-partner systems change. Um, 
those three big criteria are also being used by the Office of the Treaty Commissioner here to do a big indicator framework for um, truth and reconciliation calls to action, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls calls to justice, um, UNDRIP, United Nations Declarations for Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, and I think uh, the Royal Commission, they went back, so they went back through all of the documents around um, reconciliation and have created this massive framework around indicators to, to identify and evaluate whether or not agencies are doing reconciliation and to what capacity. And so what we've decided locally is that all the folks who are building uh, evaluation frameworks need to tie their indicators back to these three criteria so that there's a little bit of crossover and some options to um, share data in a, in a more uh, organized manner. Uh, the indicators list is still a work in progress. It's really hard to get 17 local evaluators to agree on indicators. At one point, there was like 300 of them, and I, I, I put my foot down and said, we can't, we can't monitor 300 indicators, so we need to pick a handful. Uh, so that process is ongoing, and it should be done by the end of this. Well, it'll definitely be done by the end of 2019. Next slide. Uh, and so I can't talk about work in Saskatoon or in Saskatchewan or in Canada, for that matter, without talking about disrupting power dynamics and colonial constructs. Uh, and so the centerpiece that says shared understanding of our history, systems that benefit us all, authentic relationships and vibrant cultures and worldviews are the four uh, pillars that come from Office of the Treaty Commissioner's and Reconciliation Saskatoon's work. And so all the work of the SPRP is also embedded into those four pillars. Um, in Saskatoon, we work uh, diligently to be committed to disrupting and dismantling colonial constructs that consistently create overrepresentation and uh, perpetuate trauma and, and poverty in Saskatoon or in this province or in Canada for that matter. Um, it's extremely difficult work, but it's extremely important. And uh, part of that is language, part of that is commitments to knowing where the work that I'm doing falls within the truth and reconciliation calls to action uh, and all of the other um, strategies and calls to justice, but also uh, locally around building relationships with indigenous people that are authentic, uh, breaking down the historical, um, sort of checkbox pieces. And so this would drive us back to the idea that standing in the mud of community relationship, um, this is about trust. And so it's extremely difficult for indigenous agencies to trust colonial constructs uh, because of the trauma and histories that have gone on over the last 150 years in this, in this community. And so a lot of it is about dropping uh, ego uh, and turf and the way that things have been done in the past and recognizing that coming together under a sort of a space and if I can sort of take Willie Ermine's work around ethical space is that that common space between colonial worldview or western worldview and indigenous ways of knowing there's a space in between where they overlap and that's the time that's the space where we try to spend most of our time what is the overlap and what is my role as a as a settler, as, a, as someone who has benefited from the privilege of colonial construct, what is my responsibility to disrupting those power dynamics uh, and to building um, a common agenda that is not perpetuating them? Next slide. And then the last piece is around inclusion, inclusion of people with lived or living experience. Um, we are committed and have been committed to doing that work uh, consistently since since I've been in um, the, the coordinator role of the SPRP. Uh, so that's about eight years for me. Um, this is entirely resourced by community and by community partners. Uh, we try to have uh, representation of people with lived experience at every event. Um, that representation is funded, supported, uh, and is in attempts to break down all barriers for inclusive practice. Um, and so the funding, I know lots of people were like, how are you funding this? The funding piece, um, I, I have a fair amount of human capital in this community, and so I can speak quite clearly with funders around capacity and 
expectations and commitments. And so lots of folks will say that creating a culture of inclusion and the inclusion of people with lived experience is a critical piece, but if they're not resourcing it, um, then is it truly a priority? And are they resourcing it in a manner that is perpetuating colonial constructs and systems that, and creating barriers? And so I'm consistently talking about um, how to break down those barriers, what the expectations are, what the role of, of resourcing, resourcing to an equitable, with an equitable lens, um, with money, but then also providing supports to make sure that out-of-pocket expenses or mental health and addictions and harm reduction methodologies are also embedded in the work. Now you can switch it. That's it. And it's 11.30, I did okay. Thank you, Colleen. Um, that was really, um, uh, really comprehensive. Uh, you really sh shared some some valuable insights into the your experience of um, the value of shared vision and collaboration, um, and highlighting some really important pieces around relationships and networks and disrupting the power power imbalances and creating these safe spaces uh, of inclusion that. Um, can be uncomfortable mm -hmm. as at times as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think now we'll, we're just going to open it up to questions, uh, any comments, anything anyone would like to share. I think um, Melinda has written in the ch chat box that a uh, oh, wow, great project, uh, interested more in the 12 bold steps. So mm -hmm. we, we can follow up with... Uh, at the end of this, we'll, we'll send a follow-up email and we can include the uh, information on the um, 12, uh, on that strategy, right? And share that afterwards. Any uh, questions, comments? Feel free to just take yourself off mute and uh, join in or uh, send a question in the um, chat box. Hi, Elle. It's Phil from Chatham, Kent, Ontario. Uh, first of all, fantastic presentation. I was, I was really happy I joined this conversation and, and learned more about what the Saskatoon Poverty Reduction Partnership is up to. I had a question around uh, the, the piece around inclusion, especially around sort of maybe your task. I, I, we call them task force tables, but sort of action groups working on different parts of the 12 bold ideas. The inclusion of people with lived experience, do you find that the uh, the note you're reading out at the beginning of every meeting is enough to ensure that the uh, the respect is there from maybe more professional or more um, uh, more committee leaders for people with lived experience and how they might not necessarily have experience sitting on committees or do you pick people specifically from your first voices groups who have that experience and feel comfortable so they don't necessarily have any challenges in the committee room just wanted to see what your thoughts were on that. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so we're actually in a bit of a transition around inclusive practice. Um, we, so SPRP uh, built that, well, SPRP stole, <laughs> let's say, that opening statement from an organization called the Anti-Poverty Coalition and Passion for Action Against Homelessness, which was a, a cohort of folks who are, who are entirely, it's like an entirely lived experience group of people. Um, they self-convene, they do projects, um, and generally speaking, folks from sector or services don't always, didn't always go to those meetings. There were a couple of us who went uh, as support mechanisms, but basically uh, between 15 and 20 folks would come together and talk monthly about what's going on in poverty in their lives. They built that opening statement themselves, and we asked to modify it. And so... I feel like there's buy-in from folks with lived experience around the statement because it was built by them for them. Uh, and they read it at their meeting. It's slightly, theirs is slightly different. But um, as we sort of build capacity in the team of people with lived experience, there won't be that connection back to that history. Um, we just had a funded pro research, funded research project where we hired a university 
a PhD candidate to do um, some coffee conversations to build capacity with people who live experience and we're in the process of building a community of practice. And so there's 55 individuals who have self-identified uh, as being interested in that. And when, and at each of the coffee chats, um, the opening statement was read. And I feel like the data that came back around appreciation of the opening statement from those with lived experience was positive. Um, and I feel like sometimes though, in meetings where I know, particularly when there's a funder there and they wanna uh, exercise their, what their perceived right of uh, controlling maybe dialogue or work happens, then it's my role to pull us back to guiding principles in the opening statement. And so that's what I mean, like I have a fair amount of human capital to do that, right? So sometimes it's done in the meeting and sometimes it's done after the meeting. I have two folks with lived experience who have been involved from the very, like even before I was involved, um, who are also capable of pulling people from particularly funders or who have power imbalances aside and having a very open dialogue. Uh, and so sometimes I support that as well. Um, but it is, I mean, power is an ongoing problem, particularly when the power is tied to, to money. I don't know, did I answer your question? Absolutely, yeah, th thank you very much. I really appreciate it, especially the last piece around uh, the power imbalances, you're quite right in this work. Uh, I'm, I'm finding, especially as we're playing task forces, multi-sector task forces, the business community, especially in rural Ontario, can uh, walk in with perceptions that people with lived experience want their money and that's all they're there for. Um, right. And that that is what uh, we have to start working on as, as task forces. I think sometimes in this work, we assume that if we just pull some people around the table, we're used to committees, we know what goes on, we have a productive discussion, we move on with the day, but mm -hmm. we ourselves have to check and reflect on our practices as well as coordinators mm -hmm. to make sure that our power and balance is being checked as well. Yeah, and so I often, um, we, off, we talk about what the definition of lived experience is too, quite openly, and we check our judgment of people's lived experience at the door. And so if someone self-identifies as having lived experience, then that's good enough. And there is no, it's, it's not welcome to challenge whether their lived experience is quote good enough or deep enough or new enough um, to be identified as lived experience. And so I recently, so SCAA, um, the Safe Community Action Alliance is working on a crystal meth project. And so we just had this conversation and we're challenged a little bit around, did people with lived experience of crystal meth use um, provide insights? And of course they did in a large, um, a large percentage of the people who provided information have quote, self-identified current experiences with crystal meth. Does that mean that they're current users? Or does that mean that they're impacted at a family level or at a community level? Um, we didn't really, I mean, we did, we had a, a cohort of folks who currently identified as currently using, but other folks, um, we didn't really ask them to identify what their lived experience was. Uh, and so at a meeting recently, we thought if we asked everyone in the room who has been impacted or who has, quote, current lived experience of, with crystal meth, who would stand up and we figured almost everybody in the room would because it's such a prevalent thing right now in our community. And so um, we need to be careful of that perception and judgment and privilege. And if that's coming from your business folks, then um, it's about conversations and trust and dialogue and building relationships so that they understand uh, and backing up. It's about truth, right? And so for us, we often have to unpack the untruths uh, and unlearn and relearn um, the truths of what's going on in our communities. Great points. Thank you very much. That's great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing. Um, and thanks for that question, Phil. Um, I, I'm just looking back at the chat box and seeing that Erica has a, is posing the question around uh, if you could talk more around the importance of language in the context of reconciliation. Sure. Um, so one of the things, one of my commitments, I guess, as a professional working in this world, um, personal and professional uh, commitments to the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action, uh, is around truth and the role 
um, that learning about truth plays in reframing uh, the way we talk about things that have happened um, and who we are and what our privilege is uh, and being open around that dialogue. I think one of the pieces that I've been struck with recently, and if you haven't heard of a conference called Wichihidoin, there's a conference in Saskatoon called Wichihidoin. Um, it just happened, it's in October every year. So there'll be another one next, I hope there's another one next year. I'm gonna plug it now and they, I don't know. But if you haven't been to a Wichihidoin conference here, you should come. It's an amazing two day intensive learning um, Indigenous Peoples Conference. Uh, it's an Indigenous engagement conference. And so at that, at that conference, um, we talked specifically about the role that colonial constructs and, and the normals that I grew up, the way I talk, the way I act, the things that I bring to the table, um, all of those things are embedded and often are embedded bias. Um, so I talk a lot about the idea of possessive language. So if your documents say our Indigenous people or our people with lived experience, um, that possessive language and the, and the role that possessive language plays in perpetuating oppression and perpetuating cycles uh, is extremely important. So that's the first thing that you can look at. Um, once you see it and once you sort of reframe why it's not necessarily a good thing to say, um, you'll see it everywhere. It, it literally makes me cringe when I see it on a regular basis. Um, and then the idea is like, how do you build a space and how do you talk about space and how do you build relationships where um, you are aware of the way that you're perceiving things or the things that you're talking about are perceived by other people who may have roots, uh, long rooted histories of trauma. Um, and so often people will dismiss others because their language might be aggressive or perceived to be offensive. Um, but when you unpack and really talk about the root causes of where that language is coming from, um, it's rooted in long-standing colonial uh, injustice. And so we often, particularly within colonial constructs with power, um, we get our backs up or we feel like we're being attacked when people question or use language that maybe um, challenge our systems of normal. Uh, and so we need to be less uh, turfy and less egoy and realize that when people are challenging the colonial construct of our language, um, it's actually because it's rooted in long-standing histories. And so, I don't know, Eric, if I answered the question or not, but I feel like it's, it's about really recognizing the way that you interact with people uh, and that authenticity. It, it also then boils down to the concept of trust, right? And so um, we work diligently in Saskatoon to build relationships of trust with Indigenous agencies and people. Um, and often have to, I often have to check my privilege and bias. And quite often I, I, I'm grateful for a handful of amazing Indigenous uh, leaders and elders who have taught things along the way. Um, but those teachings about reframing the things that um, sort of get my back up and why is my back up and what are those things that are triggering me and what are they rooted in? Uh, and realizing that often it's rooted in power and, and the perception that I might be losing some of that power. Thank you. Um, hopefully that uh, answered your question, uh, Erica. Um, uh, I'm gonna move to another question from Melissa in the chat box. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any process evaluation suggestions to mm -hmm. ensure everyone still feels tethered to these principles throughout the project? Uh, <laughs> um, well, I feel like I'm the one who, as the coordinator, I'm the one who like holds the pieces together. Um, I think we do we do a little bit of process eval around efficacy of meetings and connectivities. Um, I do a fair amount of speaking engagements and those kind of things to push people together. Uh, I think the evaluation team really owns the bulk of that evaluation. I don't do, I personally don't do a lot of the individualized sort of work. Um, they decided that they would do 
um, two internal process evaluations after the framework was done. And so the first one will be up and coming right away around the last year, um, all the pieces that fell into place to make it happen and what, what the next steps are. But not a ton, mainly because there's not a ton of capacity for me. I would be open to people's process evaluation suggestions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, anyone who's on the call, feel free to uh, join in and offer some, some insights or uh, suggestions uh, if, you, if you have some to share. I just, uh, Eric, I just made a comment about yeah. the language. Let me just re, let's mm -hmm. just address that too. Like, here's the thing about privilege and particularly about space when the space is not inclusive. So when, when I find myself in an environment where it's predominantly people with a lot of power, predominantly white, um, predominantly uh, high level professionals, I feel like we get lazy with our language uh, and uh, we feel safe to let down that learning. And so um, if I think back to conferences that I've been to in the past where, well, and even Kitchener, let's, I'll pick on Kitchener, but not pick on, but I'll just sort of use it as an example. Um, when the mayor of Kitchener was asked about work that they're doing on reconciliation and he talked specifically about land recognition, um, the idea that he would be asked in that arena and he could respond with, well, you know, we're going to work on a land recognition and that be the sort of checkbox. Um, I feel like the space was safe for him to do that. If that was his response in an environment where the folks in the, in the room were predominantly indigenous, the response to that would have been considerably different. And so I feel like we need to be cautious. And one of the commitments that I've made as even when there's a lack of diversity in the room, I have to uphold um, the depth and learning around language change. Um, because otherwise I just become complacent in my normal. I, I call it lazy, but it, I mean, I'm not lazy. I'm just, it's just easier to just do the things that I've been doing all along than it is to stop and think, oh, I shouldn't actually be using this language to describe this work, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that was helpful. Um, and I would, I would add just a perspective around sometimes we're just too also of so afraid of making mistakes or doing things wrong that it prevents us from doing anything or trying. Um, yes. So, so I think kind of almost <laughs> not being <laughs> afraid to make those mistakes, but, you know, make sure that you're, you know, you know, you're trying to do things, things right, and talking to, to those, um, everyone who you should be talking to, and and getting mm -hmm. guidance on that. But um, we often, I think, so many people are just afraid, afraid that it's it's going to be wrong that you don't mm -hmm. do it. So we shouldn't be afraid of um, trying to. It kind of pr prevents us from moving forward in making any progress as well. So, yeah. We can make make mistakes as we go along. <laughs> yeah, and if we go back to building relationships and really um, supporting an ethical space in which to make those changes happen, um, then the mistakes are fine as long as they're done in like a respectful and truthful mm -hmm. manner, right? And so I don't know, half the time, I don't even know that I have bias, right? I just grew up knowing the things that I know and those are my normals. Um, and my normal isn't everybody else's normal. And so I have to stop thinking that, and I have to stop responding in a way where um, I'm shocked or I, I act in a certain way that someone else isn't doing it the way that I would be doing it. Because just because it's the way I do it and the way that I learned how to do it and the things that I gained through whatever, privilege and bias and ex experience and everything, it's not, those aren't negative things. Those are just who I am. And so how do I, how do I address the fact that the people that I'm working with and, and alongside and, and throughout all of this work don't have the same normals as I do? And that's okay. So you just need to recognize them. Um, sometimes you need to challenge them. Sometimes you need to accept them. And sometimes you need to apologize. 
and own mistakes and apologizing is amazing, right? And so when you apologize for things and own the fact that you just didn't know, the, the relationship and, and the network and the trust changes dramatically. But forgiving and, and apologizing and doing those things are generally not common. Mm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, okay. Great. Uh, any other comments? I know there was a little bit around developmental evaluation that Erica was uh, sharing, um, yeah. and we're happy to uh, also share some information on that, the developmental evaluation. Uh, as Erica says, that's really um, been freeing from, you know, the rigid expectations mm -hmm. and, and to focus on learning more as, as you go as yeah. well. So um any other questions as we're approaching the end of the hour any other questions uh oh, it looks like a couple things have come up um so it's uh looks like uh the opening statement uh people are really interested in so um I think this is Michelle uh, messaging that uh, she also really appreciates checking privilege. Another presenter at the CRP conference did this very briefly, but it is very impactful. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we, we can share this information. These slides will be shared at the end of the, uh, as a follow-up, so. Uh, and all the tools that are mentioned, like I have links to all those tools, so. We can, if they're not Tamarack tools, I know we talked about lots of them are Tamarack tools, but some of them aren't. So if you want more details about any of the tools that are listed, I can flip that information to you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Colleen. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, if there are any, any follow-up questions to this, um, if you have any directly for Colleen or um, they can come through to me as well. Um, and we'll, we're happy to uh, address them as they come in after you, um, after you're able to reflect a little bit on uh, some of this content. So uh, we'll just move into uh, some upcoming learning opportunities to share just so that everybody has a, as a heads up, um, some of the some of uh, our upcoming um, webinars uh, on November twenty fifth, we have one uh, with uh, we're going to have our speaker Cheryl Whiskey Jack, the executive director of Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society, uh, the End Poverty Edmonton Stewardship Roundtable co chair, and she's recently been named to the National Advisory Board on Poverty. She will be. Uh, joining us for a discussion um, around meaningful engagement with individuals uh, and communities and focused on those uh, uh, with lived and living experience. What is meaningful? What is authentic uh, engagement? Um, okay, that the next one is on November 26th. Uh, we have a webinar um, with Vancouver Foundation's Lydia Kimeni and Tamarack's Paul, Paul Bourne as they talk about engaging um, communities to get input on a particular issue. So asking communities in a journey to understand participation and involvement. And then I think we have another one that's going to be coming up in December for many um, for any of our members, especially if you're new or if you've been a member for a while, this is an orientation or a reorientation to our Cities Reducing Poverty membership. So that will be in December and we will, uh, you'll be getting some follow-up information on that. Um, so for closing, uh, I would like to again thank Colleen for a really insightful and meaningful uh, presentation today. Uh, we have lots of thank you, thank yous in the, the uh, chat box. So um, 
really, really, uh, really great for, sh for sharing. And there may indeed be some follow-up questions coming our way. Um, feel free to send them to me or to Colleen um, and any other uh, comments and feedback. We will be uh, following up in the next couple of days with um, the slides for today and any resources connected with today today's uh, presentation. So thank you so much everyone for joining us um, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Bye for now. Thank you.